So good morning. Um, I'm really excited to introduce uh, our keynote, Dr. Daniel Asai. Um, so Dr. Asai is a professor and Canada Research Chair in Developmental Computer Science and Learning in the Department of Psychology and the Brain and Mind Institute at the University of Western Ontario in London, Ontario, Canada. He has degrees in psychology first class from the University of Sussex and an MSc in Neuroscience from the University of Oxford he also received his PhD from University College London. Dr. Asai is the head of the Romerica Cognition Laboratory at the University of Western Ontario. He and his team explore the developmental trajectory underlying both the typical and atypical development of numerical and mathematical skills using both behavioral and neuroimaging methods. During his career, he has won numerous awards and fellowships. And he's also a fellow of the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research and the Association for Psychological Science. Dr. Ansari has a joint appointment in the Department of Psychology in the Faculty of Education at the University of Western Ontario. His work reaches psychology, education, and neuroscience. The title of today's talk is Numbers, Brains, Development and Education, Progress, Challenges, and Promise. Dr. Ansari will be sharing insights from his interdisciplinary work also discussing the barriers and enablers of translating research findings to implications for practice. I find it inspiring that Dr. Ansai's work also looks at population of study beyond the mainstream, as he intentionally seeks to invite a global approach to research into children's development of numerical and mathematical skills. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to our exceptional speaker today. Um, it's uh, really a great honor to deliver a keynote here at early. I have lots of uh, good memories of interactions with early, be that at the, uh, at the convention. Also, I was very fortunate to be able to attend an advanced study colloquium on the rights by Neben Reshuffle, who's sitting up there some years ago now, which turned out to be extremely formative for my career. And then together with uh, my friend and colleague, Bert Asmet, uh, some years ago, we co-founded early SIG 22 Neuroscience and Education. So it's wonderful uh, to be here and uh, thank you very much. So at the outset of my talk, I'd like to begin by uh, presenting a little bit about my positionality. Um, I recognize that early uh, is a conference that brings together education researchers from a diversity of background that use various methodological approaches to look at a large array of topics that are relevant to education research. So I just want to introduce my positionality so you can understand my biases uh, before I begin my presentation. Uh, so my background is in developmental psychology and developmental cognitive neuroscience. That's a uh, uh, field where I received my formal training. My lived experiences have been predominantly in the global north, and my approach uh, methodolo not methodologically focuses on quantitative research in the summative assessments and rely on inferential statistics to draw inferences. And in terms of uh, the research focus, uh, my focus is on un better understanding the origins of individual differences in early math. So when we think about math, we typically think about the classroom and we think about uh, maybe some positive, maybe some negative experiences we've had when we went through our own schooling. But numbers are, of course, all around us and we use them in everyday lives to inform our decisions and uh, our behavior. So uh, this morning, I think most of us would have woken up. We probably wouldn't have looked at this kind of analog clock, but we would have probably looked at our phones uh, to see what time it was, and that would have immediately informed our planning. If we had to rush, if we could take a more laid back approach uh, to the morning. Uh, we all uh, traveled here, or at least the majority of us probably traveled here, uh, mainly by air, and we would have used information such as gate numbers and flight numbers and departure numbers, and in my case, many delays and cancellations to inform our decisions and our behaviors. Um, when we wake up in the morning, we might check the news and we post lots of numerical information when we look at the news, when we, for example, look at uh, business news or other pieces of news. And uh, mistakes with numbers can be very costly. Uh, anybody here from Canada except for me uh, might recognize this image. This is the so-called Gimli Glider. 
And the Gimney glider was an Air Canada 767 aircraft, uh, which had just been introduced into the fleet. And at the time, Air Canada was uh, switching uh, to metric units. However, unfortunately, the fuel uh, indicator broke down, and so the ground crew had to calculate the fuel load by hand. And they used uh, the units of pounds as the conversion rate, and consequently, the aircraft was only half tanked. So halfway from its journey to Edmonton, Montreal, it had to glide to a landing in Gimli. So this is one of many examples of where you know, making mistakes with numbers can be extremely costly. So given the importance of numerical and mathematical skills, it begs the question, how do these numerical skills develop? And that's really what I'm going to focus on for the majority of my talk today. And here it is useful to consider what are some of the key foundational competencies under living math. Uh, we know that foundational competencies are incredibly important. They give children uh, a start in a given academic subject, and they sort of are the initial uh, catalyst for a developmental trajectory of growth. Uh, but we also know that when children lack those foundational competencies, they will uh, continually fall behind the, their peers who have those foundational competencies. So in the domain of reading, Keith Stanovich some time ago now termed this the Matthew effect in reading, and we know that a similar Matthew effect also exists in the development of mathematical and numerical skills. So therefore, it is really important to investigate what are the foundational skills underpinning math so that we can then use them as evidence-informed targets for intervention and also for screening children who might be at risk of developing mathematical difficulties or simply children who, uh, for lack of exposure, haven't had those foundational competencies yet and need to do some catching up. So what do we know about the foundational competencies under petty math? Well, over the past few decades, a lot of research has been devoted to better understand how we and other species process numerical sets in the world around us. So you could look at this slide of dots and you'll be able to quickly estimate without counting, without using your symbolic knowledge, uh, roughly how many dots there are. If I showed you another slide of dots that was different in terms of the number of items in the set, you would be able to compare it to this set of dots and judge which one is numerically larger. This is sometimes referred to as non-symbolic number processing. And research has shown that even very young babies are capable of non-symbolic number processing. So seminal research by Fei Shu and Liz Belke in 2000 showed that six-month-old infants can discriminate between eight and 16 dots, but they can't discriminate between eight and 12 dots. That means they have a very fuzzy or approximate sense of numerical quantity. Sometimes this has been called the approximate number system or the analog magnitude system. The notion being here is that there is a system in the brain that is perhaps present from birth onwards that supports rough discriminations between quantities and can be used to guide behaviors. There's also been a lot of comparative research in this area showing that we share with other animals this basic sense of non-symbolic uh, numerical magnitude. So for example, what I'm showing you here is uh, from a study by Jessica Cantlon and Elizabeth Braddon in which monkeys were trained to order numerosities by pressing the smaller, numerically smaller array first and then the numerically larger array. And what's surprising is that not only can animals, non-human primates, learn this, but they can also generalize it to sets that they haven't seen before. So this is sort of reflective of true numerical abilities in non-human primates. And all the behavioral signatures that uh, govern uh, non-symbolic number discrimination are highly similar between species. And indeed, it, this is not just true of non-human primates, but it's also uh, evident in other non-human animals, such as bees and salamanders. Numerical cognition has indeed been investigated in many different species. Moreover, we know something about the foundations of our numerical abilities uh, from neuroscience. So from all the way down at the level of single-cell neurophysiology in awake-behaving monkeys to 
uh, human studies that look at large-scale networks using methods such as functional magnetic resonance imaging. We know that areas in and around the enterprise, as South has highlighted here in yellow, are associated with doing things such as dog discrimination and exhibit very similar signatures to those found in behavioral studies. This has led to the suggestion that there is a developmental continuity in the brain systems underlying non-symbolic number processing. And this is very nicely illustrated in this figure here, taken from a review paper by Melissa Libertas and Liz Brannan uh, some years ago now. And what you can see here going from left to right is sort of this notion that even in very young babies, this is work by Veronique Isard, showing uh, using EEG source localization, that when you show a, a baby a stream of dots and occasionally you change the number of dots in that stream, you see signal recovery in an area of the right hemisphere in the parietal cortex. And then uh, when you look at four-year-old children, this is work by Jessica Cantlon using functional magnetic resonance imaging, you see very similar brain areas responding to change in the number of dots in a display. And finally, on the rightmost side, you see data from Manuela Piazza's lab uh, showing that in adults, you also see this change detection, this numerical change detection, if you like, associated with activation in the right parietal cortex. So all of this data suggests that we are born with some non-symbolic number processing capacities and that these uh, capacities seem to exhibit both ontogenetic, developmental, as well as phylogenetic evolutionary continuity. So this has uh, led to the suggestion that we're sort of born with an approximate number system which uh, forms the foundation of our subsequent math learning and our symbolic number abilities. But of course, humans are different from non-human animals in that we have, over the course of cultural history, developed symbolic representations of a number. And of course, there's a great diversity of those symbolic representations, and they've changed dramatically over the last six to 7,000 years. And now, Hindu-Arabic numerals are sort of a universal language of mathematics, and in literate societies, children have to learn the meaning of numerical symbols. They're not born with pre-existing representational structures that allow them to immediately process the meaning of numerical symbols. Instead, they have to go through a long process of learning the meaning of those symbols and become fluent in using them uh, to determine numerical quantity and subsequently in numerical operations as well. So this then raises the question how the innate approximate number system and the acquired symbolic systems are related to one another over developmental time. And this sort of uh, leads to a broader question which you can explore within the domain of numerical cognition, which is how do culture and biology interact with one another? What is the role of innate system in structuring the acquisition of cultural knowledge such as symbolic number knowledge? Now, there are of course many possibilities uh, by which non-symbolic and symbolic systems might be related to one another. Perhaps most intuitively, one might postulate that given that we are born with a non-symbolic system for the processing of numerical quantity, that it is this system that provides the scaffold for the acquisition of symbolic cultural number knowledge. However, it's equally possible that these systems develop independently from one another, and that once children have learned the meaning of numerical symbols, uh, that knowledge changes the way in which they process quantities in the world around them, given that they now have a single abstract representation of a set that might help them to focus on the non-symbolic quantities. Or indeed, it may be the case that the innate non-symbolic system and the symbolic cultural system are related to one another in fully bidirectional ways. So how can we go about exploring this question about the developmental dynamics between innate and cultural systems in the early development of numerical cognition? Well, in order to do that, what we need are, is a longitudinal approach. We need to repeatedly test the same children using the same methods. And using uh, methods such as cross-select panel models, we can then estimate the direction of the relationship over developmental time. 
Now, some years ago now, my then postdoctoral fellow, Ian Lyons, now an associate professor at the Georgetown University, and I had the uh, opportunity to collaborate with the Toronto District School Board who were interested in developing screening tools. And so we uh, tested just over 500 children who were at the time in what in Canada we refer to as senior kindergarten. This is the second year of a two-year kindergarten uh, cycle. And uh, we recruited them from 35 schools in the Toronto District School Board. And they were tested both in the fall of their senior kindergarten year, so right at the beginning of their senior kindergarten year, as well as towards the end in uh, spring and we used paper and pencil measures. We had a diversity of measures as this was part of a larger screening project, but for uh, the purposes of today, I'm just gonna introduce you to the two critical tasks that uh, we used to evaluate the developmental relationships between symbolic and non-symbolic number processing. And that was on the one hand, a dot comparison task in which children were shown uh, these pairs of dots and they were asked to cross out as quickly and as accurately as they could the numerically larger dot array. And the same was true for the number comparison task where they were shown two Indo-Arabic numerals and were asked to, as quickly as, uh, as possibly as they could, to cross out the numerically larger of the two Indo-Arabic numerals. Each task had a time limit of two minutes. This was really trying to assess the fluency with which children can not only activate magnitude representations, but compare magnitude representations across these two formats as well. So in terms of the analysis, we used a simple uh, multiple regression cross-leg panel model. And so you have, uh, we acquired data of course, as you remember, at the beginning of kindergarten, at the end of kindergarten. And so what we did, if we wanted to, for example, understand if non-symbolic at time one predicts symbolic at time two, we held, uh, it, we took into account the autoregressive effect of symbolic at time one. So taking out essentially the correlation between symbolic and non-symbolic at time one, and then looking at whether residual variance of non-symbolic at time one predicts anything about symbolic at time two. We then also investigated the reverse direction, which would be saying uh, regress symbolic at time one on non-symbolic at time two whilst holding for uh, non-symbolic at time one. And that's what th this looked like. So what did we find using this approach? Well, first of all, we found that there was no evidence that non-symbolic predicted symbolic, or in other words, that non-symbolic at time one predicted something about the change over that time period in symbolic number processing. Instead, we found evidence for the reverse direction, whereby symbolic at time one predicted individual differences in non-symbolic at time two, whilst controlling for non-symbolic at time. So this piece of evidence then suggests that when we think about the developmental dynamics between symbolic and non-symbolic number processing, it is not as though there is evidence to suggest that non-symbolic scaffold symbolic, but rather that when children are developing symbolic number skills, this changes the way in which they do non-symbolic tasks, such as the dot discrimination tasks. I'll go into the reasons or this, what we speculate might be going on here in a little while, but I also want to present you data from a follow-up study in which we made several improvements to our statistical modeling uh, by adding a third time point. So the Toronto District School Board gave us the opportunity to uh, test the same children again in the middle of grade one. And uh, these data were then analyzed by my postdoctoral fellow, Nathan Lau, uh, so in the follow-up study, as I said, we added an additional time point uh, at the end of grade one. Sorry, I said the middle of grade one. It's actually the end of grade one. And here we had, of course, non-symbolic, symbolic. We also had a mixed comparison task in which essentially children have to decide whether the dot array or the Arabic numeral is numerically larger. This turns out to be quite a tricky task for children. And we also gave them some simple arithmetic problems as well. And now having three time points, uh, we used a, what is called a random intercept cross-leg panel model. This improves on the traditional cross-leg panel model because it allows you to better distinguish between within subject versus between subject change. We want to uh, measure within subject change, of course, and uh, do not want to have confounds from between subject differences, and that is what the RICLP um, affords you to do. So what we did in this study is to contrast different potential uh, developmental models of the interrelationships between these various tasks. 
So the first model we looked at was the mapping model. So the mapping model essentially predicts that non-symbolic number processing goes on to influence the development of other skills, including itself, but also symbolic number processing and arithmetic. The refinement model, on the other hand, predicts that everything is driven by symbolic number knowledge, that the acquisition of symbolic number knowledge goes on to influence uh, non-symbolic number processing, symbolic as well as uh, um, arithmetic. And then, of course, we also had a model in which we allowed everything to relate to everything else, which is sort of the fully bidirectional model. So the question then is, uh, which model best fit the data? And what we saw here is entirely consistent with our earlier two time point findings, which is that the refinement model was the best fitting model. In other words, symbolic number processing influences all these other competencies and uh, task performance over developmental time over these three time points, including arithmetic, non-symbolic number processing, uh, mixed uh, uh, performance, and so forth. So, one of the things you might say to me is, well, that's very interesting, but you were testing five-year-old children. Five-year-old children have already had a lot of experience with number symbols. Uh, perhaps there is a change in the di developmental dynamics. If you looked earlier, perhaps you would find that non-symbolic number processing influences symbolic number processing early on, and then uh, things change around, and symbolic number processing now constrains uh, the further development of non-symbolic number processing. And that would be a very legitimate point to make. Uh, thankfully, uh, Slack notifications are deeply annoying. Um, uh, thankfully, uh, just last year, uh, you moved in Daniel Hyde's lab um, at, uh, at, uh, at, uh, in, in um, Illinois, um, provided some data to uh, basically address this concern. Uh, what they did is they studied the interrelationships between symbolic and non-symbolic number processing in a sample of two to four-year-old children. This was a one-year longitudinal study with three time points. The first two time points were only separated by two weeks, and the third time point was approximately a year after the uh, collection of the first time point. And they looked at children's well, the number knowledge, their general cognitive abilities, as well as their uh, dot comparison to measure non-symbolic number processing or precision within the approximate number system. So what did they find when they looked at the developmental dynamics in question at an earlier age? Well, what you can see here is data from the, uh, first of all, data from the two-week uh, time gap. And what you can see very clearly is that whilst the relationship between verbal number knowledge at time point one and ANS precision, so non-symbolic number processing at time point two, is significant, the reverse direction is not significant. So consistent with both Ian's and Nathan's data, what Yimu showed here is that ANS precision at time one in these very young children does not seem to scaffold the development of verbal number knowledge. Now, what they then also looked at is the relationship between the second and the third time point uh, to better understand how these developmental dynamics might unfold at a larger time scale. And what you can see here is, again, there is no evidence that ANS precision at time point two uh, constrained math ability at time point three. Instead, it was true again that verbal album knowledge at time point two uh, uh, influenced ANS uh, precision at time point three. So we can see that taken together that even if you look at these developmental dynamics between symbolic and non-symbolic number processing in young children who are just at the beginning of their uh, developmental trajectory when it comes to early number knowledge and number word knowledge and uh, their ability to name, compare, and order numerical symbols, that in these young children, we don't see any evidence that the approximate number system, non-symbolic number processing, constrains the acquisition of their verbal number skills. So what can we make of all of this? This may be counterintuitive. Uh, we, you know, one way of thinking suggests that there must be an innate basis uh, for number processing. There must be an innate basis for number processing that scaffolds or constrains the acquisition of cultural knowledge, such as symbolic number knowledge. 
But the way we think about it is uh, that this evidence suggests that symbolic number knowledge influences non-symbolic number from an early age. And what might be going on here, uh, we hypothesize, is that symbolic number knowledge uh, serves as an attentional filter. Once children have representations of number symbols, this changes the way in which they view sets of the world around them, because they can now categorize them much more precisely using symbolic number knowledge. And indeed, there's already evidence just looking at the development of non-symbolic number that developmental changes in non-symbolic number are not due to increasing precision of the underlying system, but rather that children over developmental time become better at focusing on non-symbolic sets and on ignoring conflicting variables such as the area of a set or its density and so forth. So uh, there is evidence to suggest that development involves increasing ability to focus on number and ignore conflicting and irrelevant information. And what we speculate is that number, symbolic number knowledge plays a really important role here in sharpening uh, that attentional focus on number and away from other properties. And we have some work underway now to test this hypothesis directly, both at the behavioral and the, the brain level. So we have hypothesized that symbolic number changes perception of and focus on non-symbolic sets. So uh, hopefully we'll have some data uh, to present on this at the next early meeting. So now I'd like to uh, invite you to participate in a small experiment. It really is a small experiment and yeah, of course completely voluntary. I'm not going to go around and distribute a set of consent forms here. Uh, so um, the small experiment will involve you uh, seeing dot arrays that I will flash up relatively quickly. And um, once I flash those dot arrays up, I want you to say as quickly as you can, either out loud if you're feeling very extrovert, uh, or uh, just in your mind if you're feeling rather shy this morning. Uh, so I want you to say as quickly as you can how many dots you see and just use a rough guess, use your approximate number system uh, and uh, try to estimate how many dots there are. Okay, are you ready? Okay. Well, like three, and then. Okay, what did you notice? Any volunteers to describe what they noticed during this process? Well, yeah, I noticed that too, you're right. That was also my observation. Sometimes you're using symbolic Sorry? Sometimes you're using a symbolic approach too. Sometimes you're using a symbolic approach for which particular quantities would we, what do you mean? Small and large. Small and large. Mm. So there were small and large sets, and it seemed to me, although we have a majority of shy people here, that the small sets were, uh, uh, were named very quickly. So this, uh, what you just experienced is the difference between small and large number processing. And there's lots of data to suggest that relatively small sets and large sets are processed differently. This is sometimes referred to as subitizing, or the ability to rapidly enumerate small sets from about one to three. And this has been documented in a lot of different research papers. I just picked one here, a beautiful study by Susanna Revkin, published some years ago now. And what you can see down on uh, your left-hand side here, when you look at the errors, is what we in Canada call the hockey stick function. Uh, maybe you call that in, in Finland too, the hockey stick function. And uh, basically what this shows is that for, uh, for uh, numerosities that are very small, for one to three, you almost see no increase in the slope. There's no effect on errors. People are just making no errors at all. Different people have different notions as to when the subitizing limit occurs. But in the context of considering the developmental dynamics between this, these cultural and innate uh, foundational competencies, it begs the question whether the developmental dynamics depend on the system for numerosity processing. So in other words, is it possible that there are differential de developmental dynamics? We already know that for large numbers, uh, it's, it's a unidirectional relationship, as I showed you before, where symbolic number knowledge influences non-symbolic number knowledge, but not the other way around. 
But we know very little about how that might play out in the realm of supertizable numbers. Could there be unidirectional, bidirectional relationships, and if unidirectional, in what direction? So in order to investigate this, Jade Hutchison, who was a research assistant in the lab and then uh, moved to do a PhD with Ian Lyons at Georgetown University, uh, took a closer look at our Toronto District School Board data. And what Jane did is she uh, um, divided the trials into those which only contained uh, uh, numbers within the supertizing range from one to three, uh, and contrasted that with numbers outside of the supertizing range, larger numbers. And she then investigated the relationship between not symbolic and symbolic for supertizable arrays and non-supertizable arrays separately to better understand whether the developmental dynamics that relate symbolic to non-symbolic differ as a function of set size and differ as a function of whether you are using the approximate number system or the uh, supertizing object or applied system. So these are just the cross-sectional results to show you both in the fall and the spring the interrelationships between these two tasks. And what you can see is that uh, consistently the relationship between symbolic and non-symbolic is larger for the small arrays compared to the large arrays. But that doesn't tell us anything about directionality uh, yet. So we should also investigate uh, the developmental dynamics. So that's what we did, and that's what you see in this figure here. If you just want to focus on the, on the top figure, panel A here, where it says small one to four, what you can see is that the relationship here is indeed bidirectional, so we see uh, significant effects going from non-symbolic to symbolic, but we also see significant effects in the reverse direction. So we also see that uh, uh, um, uh, 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 symbolic influences non-symbolic for the small number ages. And you can see that although this relationship is bidirectional, there is an asymmetry in that relationship whereby the uh, direction from symbolic to non-symbolic is stronger than the direction from non-symbolic to symbolic. Albeit, this differs from the large number data, which you can see below in panel B, where, consistent with our prior data, we only find evidence for a unidirectional relationship. So we uh, see that uh, non-symbolic uh, is influenced by symbolic, but it itself does not influence the development of symbolic number knowledge. So taken together then, these data suggest that they are differential dynamics, that there are different developmental dynamics for non-symbolic quantities in the supertizing range and non-symbolic quantities outside of the supertizing range. So outside of the supertizing range, we see evidence to support the notion that symbolic influence the development of non-symbolic number skills. Uh, but for the supertizing range, we see uh, uh, evidence for bidirectional relationships. And there is an ongoing debate in the field of numerical and mathematical cognition as to whether the object tra uh, tracking system or the object file system that supports supertizing may be part of the uh, foundational basis for the acquisition of symbolic number knowledge and these data certainly uh, would uh, uh, give support in that direction, but I would again highlight that even though the relationship in the supertizing range is bidirectional, um, there was an asymmetry whereby the direction from symbolic to non-symbolic was stronger than the direction from non-symbolic to symbolic. So another way we might try to better understand the relationships between innate representations of number and culturally acquired representations of number is to look uh, at the level of the brain and to ask uh, how are symbolic and non-symbolic number represented in the brain? Uh, are there differences? Are there similarities? What does that look like? So when we look at the literature and we look for, well, what kind of neural processes are engaged when we do think such a non-symbolic dot discrimination task. What we see is that areas in and around the right intraparietal sulcus are engaged. So this is again the data from Jessica Cantillon with four-year-old children and adults. And what you can very clearly see here is 
that if you look at the sort of pink and green areas, uh, those are areas that are uh, activated when there is a number change, when, for example, you've seen a stream of 32 dots, and then suddenly there's 16 dots, then you see sort of signal increases in these right lateralized brain regions. And the same is, of course, true of very young babies, where you see this right lateralization. And this is a pattern that runs throughout the literature, where you see that non-symbolic number processing is associated with activation in the right intraparietal sockets. When we look at symbolic number processing, however, what we most commonly see is a pattern suggests of left lateralization, perhaps greater engagement with the verbal system overall, the left lateralized verbal system. Uh, so, for example, in a number of studies, we've used a method called fMRI adaptation, where we will present people with a digit six over and over again and then uh, intersperse it with different numbers occasionally. And when we look at the response to these different numbers, we see that uh, the uh, signal change is most tightly associated with the left parietal cortex. And we also know from developmental work uh, using an individual differences approach that when uh, children are in the scanner and do a symbolic number comparison task, they activate the left intraparietal sulcus, and interestingly, the degree to which they activate the left intraparietal sulcus is correlated with their math abilities. So there seems to be a direct relationship then between symbolic number processing in the left intraparietal sulcus and individual differences in mathematical abilities. And indeed, when we take all of the literature together, this is just from adult data, and we conduct a meta-analysis, as my former graduate student, Marais Zopolowski, did, who is now uh, an assistant professor at Toronto Metropolitan University. Uh, we used an uh, approach called ALE, which allows you to essentially conduct a neuroimaging meta-analysis. And we looked at all of the available studies in adults uh, where people had measured uh, brain activity using fMRI uh, whilst participants were either doing symbolic or non-symbolic uh, numerical tasks. And what we can see here is although there were quite a few overlapping areas, we see a pattern of distinction between symbolic and non-symbolic that is consistent with the data I showed you before. So when Mariah uh, contrasted activation during symbolic number processing and ask which brain areas are more engaged by symbolic number processing than not symbolic number processing, she found activation in the left parietal cortex. But running the reverse contrast where you don't know, ask which brain areas on average in a meta-analytic sense are more activated by non-symbolic than symbolic processing, so you see activation in the right hemisphere. So we see at the level of the brain also a distinction between these different representations. Of course, we need to do much more work in terms of brain imaging to understand the interactions and possible dissociations over the course of learning and development. But early data from James Booth's lab suggests that the kind of unidirectionality that we found in the behavioral data also holds true for the brain imaging data, whereby individual differences in brain activation during non-symbolic number processing influence the development of symbolic uh, brain uh, activation related to symbolic number processing, but not the other way about. I don't have time to speak about this today, but we've also gone beyond, you know, univariate activation patterns and meta-analysis to investigating sort of using multivariate methods, the representational structure during symbolic and non-symbolic number processing. And uh, this is true also of many other labs, including Bert de Smet's lab and, uh, and other groups around the globe. And what uh, the consensus seemed to be is that there is more evidence for representational dissimilarity between symbolic and non-symbolic than there is for representational uh, similarity. So the brain imaging data, just like the behavioral data, seem to suggest that yes, cultural uh, and innate systems exist, but they're not necessarily directly related to one another, either at the level of behavior during development or at the level of the brain. So I want to uh, provide you with an interim summary before I slightly switch gears. Um, so what I've shown you so far is that innate skills, such as the approximate number system, do not scaffold symbolic number skills. We have no evidence for that. Uh, instead, we have evidence to suggest that symbols refine innate systems over developmental time, or in other words, provide the vehicle by which children are able to attend to non-symbolic quantities in the world around them in a more efficient way. 
we see different roles for small and large number processing systems, whereby small number processing seems to exhibit bidirectional relationships with, non -symb with symbolic number processing, but large number processing does not. And brain imaging data suggests differences in the laterality uh, where, where non-symbolic is typically associated with right hemispheric activation and uh, symbolic is typically associated with less left hemispheric activation. And as I've alluded to, we also see representational differences when we uh, do multivariate analysis such as pattern classification or representational similarity analysis. It's actually really quite surprising to see how dissimilar uh, uh, symbolic and non-symbolic representations of number are at the brain level. So I want to switch a little bit now and ask uh, the question and uh, sort of reflect a little bit on how we might be able to uh, use what we know about foundational competencies in order to screen uh, for these foundational competencies in the classroom. Um, it is now very common in many parts of the world to do things such as phonics screeners. That they can be very useful to uh, guide teachers in terms of uh, uh, the differences between students in their classroom and inform their instructional approaches. Uh, and in math, there are lots of, uh, lots of efforts underway as well to uh, arrive at screeners that can be used for similar purposes. So 10 years ago now, uh, my then graduate student Nadia Norsworthy, who is now um, a professor at Andrews University in Michigan in the United States, uh, we designed what we called numeracy screener, which is a very simple paper and pencil test of symbolic and non-symbolic number processing, and we put this, uh, uh, this test on the web uh, free of charge. If you are interested in checking it out, www.numeracyscreener.org. Um, and as I said, this is a very basic test. It's very sim similar to the measures I described to you in the context of the study with the Toronto District School Board. We have, on the one hand, a non-symbolic subtest uh, for which children are given one minute to complete as many trials as they can. They're instructed to cross out the larger of two uh, non-symbolic uh, arrays. Uh, for symbolic, it's also one minute, and they're instructed to cross out the numerically larger of the two uh, numbers. And we've been asking lots of questions with this numeracy screener, but one of them is, does the numeracy screener actually do some predictive work? So if we measure the numeracy screener early in development, does it tell us something about later development? And um, I, I, I'm not going to bore you with all the different studies, but just introduce you to one by Zach Haas. Uh, this was actually published in, a, in, a, in an early journal, um, and uh, uh, learning and instruction. And um, what Zach looked at was whether individual differences on the numeracy screener in senior kindergarten at age five predict teacher math grades in grade one. Now we can discuss uh, the validity of using teacher grades, but the, that's the best we could do in this particular study. And what Zach found was that indeed, symbolic and non-symbolic comparison in senior kindergarten at age five is positively associated with teacher grades in grade one. We then dug a little bit deeper into the data to ask, well, uh, which one of symbolic or both uh, are unique predictors of individual differences in the grade one grades. And so we ran a multiple regression in which we entered lots of different predictors. We had lots of different measures from these children, including some language measures, some reading measures, also arithmetic, number line estimation. And uh, what this regression uh, uh, revealed was that uh, symbolic number comparison, but not non-symbolic number comparison, uh, is a unique predictor of individual differences in grade one math grades. So it seems to me that the symbolic version of the screener is really what counts, which is sort of consistent with our developmental dynamics data. We've also used this screener in order to begin to see to what extent it has any utility in discriminating between children with and without severe mathematical learning difficulties. And this is work by my former graduate student, Stephanie Bugden, who's now at the University of Winnipeg. And what Stephanie did for her PhD is she followed a group of children uh, with very persistent math difficulties or developmental dyscalculia over a period of four years. And as part of this project, she also used the numeracy screener. 
and using a logistic regression approach, what she found was that the new screen is not great, but it's not terrible at classifying for developmental dyscalculia. So the sensitivity was 62% and the specificity was 87%. So there's still a lot of work to do here, but we think this is quite promising. I should also mention that, of course, this particular work is not a prospective longitudinal study. So that's really the necessary next step that we need to do with these kinds of uh, instruments is to take a prospective longitudinal approach. One of the things we've also asked ourselves is, is the new RC screen actually a useful tool for educators? We as developmental psychologists sort of came up with this idea on the basis of our laboratory experiments and we think this could be useful, but is it actually useful? And I think this is always a really important question to ask. So in order to approach this, uh, we actually engaged in a three-year research practice collaboration with uh, a school board near Toronto called the Halton Catholic District School Board. Uh, they had approached us because they wanted to uh, do more screening work in their school board. And uh, we then uh, engaged with them in an iterative sort of research practice collaboration. So for the first year, what we did is uh, we provided some in-service uh, professional development, introduction to sort of the background that motivated the design of the screener, and also some practical information of how you actually administer this uh, neuroscience screener. And then students were uh, assessed using the neuroscience screener as well as a different tool, which I'm not gonna talk about today. And then uh, we uh, looked at the data, we shared the data with the educators, and we asked them about the usefulness of that screener. And then we iterated, and then the next year, the school board decided, given uh, on the basis of the feedback of the educators and their own observation, uh, they decided to uh, put this screener into Qualtrics, and we sort of did another cycle of evaluation. And um, this is uh, uh, work that was really done highly collaboratively. So the first author, Jennifer McDonald, at the time was the research and assessment manager for the Holden Catholic District School Board. And this is her and then postdoc Rebecca Merkley presenting their work at ARA. And so what did we find with regards to the usefulness, the perceived usefulness of the neuroscience screener? Well, when we first of all look at implementation, what we see is that this is after the first uh, phase of our collaboration. We see that um, educators found, it, found themselves relatively ready to administer the screener, but this was not perfect. Only 70% of respondents said they felt ready. So there's clearly more work to be done here in terms of how we structure uh, the professional development. And that's something we directly took into account uh, for the next cycle. Um, they found it very easy to administer, which was positive, uh, but uh, only 70% said that their students were engaged by this task. So this then led to the suggestion that we should move to uh, an online tool. In terms of usefulness, I think after the first cycle, uh, it's okay. You know, uh, we're looking at uh, just uh, over, uh, just uh, uh, under 60% have said it's very useful, or extremely useful, but a large proportion still think it's only moderately useful and slightly useful. This kind of feedback, I think, is critical when you're designing these kinds of tools. It's not to design them in isolation, but to seek input from people, from end users who are actually going to use them. And given the large interest in sort of having a more digital version, we've now actually begun to put in serious ways a digital version together. Uh, this is done in collaboration with this absolutely brilliant uh, University of Western Ontario undergraduate student, Hardy Gambia, who uh, is a double major in computer science and neuroscience with a minor in psychology, so he's like tailor-made for this project. Um, and uh, uh, Hadeep and I are very close to being able to have a pilot version and we will have that on uh, both iOS, Android, as well as for Chromebooks because Chromebooks are very much used in, in classrooms. So we hope to be able to roll this out in serious ways in the first quarter of 2024, but there is a thing in psychology called the planning fallacy, which is that you always uh, 
have good plans, but uh, time takes a while. But watch this space if you're interested in this tool. One of the things we want to do to this is we want to have different dashboards, a dashboard for parents, a dashboard for teachers, and a dashboard for researchers, so that we can really meet the needs of these diverse user bases. Uh, so a researcher might want to have you know, the aggregate data of all the people they've tested, a parent will only want individual data, and so forth. So we're working through some of the kinks of this, but we're very excited to have this come forth uh, shortly. Now, all of the data I have presented to you so far come from weird populations. You might say, well, what does he mean by weird? Although I think probably most of the people in this room know what the acronym weird stands for. It stands for Western Educated Industrialized Rich and Democratic Societies. And I think we can all admit that most of the developmental and educational psychology research really focuses on weird population. I would bet that the majority of research presented at this conference focuses on weird populations. And this is, of course, a problem for both educational research and psychological research, any research that involves uh, human subjects, because generalizability is often assumed rather than explicitly tested. And there's the real need to go beyond weird populations. Uh, we've tried to do this in the context of using our numeracy screener, so we've had the opportunity to uh, try this out in a variety of contexts, including here a school in India as well as in, in uh, West African countries. And um, since the numeracy screen is for free, we've been able to sort of ask people who've used it to share their data with us. And we now have data from six continents, uh, 13 countries, and so forth. So we're able to sort of take a more global look at uh, early number development and at the ut utility of these kinds of screeners uh, at a global scale. And if you have any numeracy screener data and you just want to participate, there's still time. We haven't yet uh, submitted the pre-registration uh, for this project. Um, but in the context of considering weird populations, I want to share with you some data that we collected in West Africa, initially in Ghana and then subsequently in the Ivory Coast. And this data really puzzled us and continues to puzzles, uh, puzzle us and really made me aware of the very deep importance of studying non-weird populations. So uh, the data from Ghana, we collaborated with Sharon Wolf, who is at the Graduate School of Education at Penn. And Sharon does a lot of outstanding work in West Africa uh, to evaluate interventions and so forth. And uh, she uh, offered to take the numeracy screen as one measure of a larger battery uh, as part of her intervention work there. So these uh, just over 370 children uh, were assessed using the numeracy screener, both the symbolic and non-symbolic version. And as an outcome measure here, we had the so-called early grade math assessment, or the EGMA, which is a measure that is often used in uh, the global south. It contains all the items that you might think of, basic number processing, arithmetic, and so forth. And when we looked at the data overall, we found a nice positive correlation whereby numeracy screen that total scores so collapsed across symbolic and non-symbolic were significantly associated with individual differences on the EGMA. However, we then dug a little bit deeper and looked at symbolic and non-symbolic separately. And here is what really surprised us. We found uh, that the correlation between non-symbolic and EGMA was stronger than the correlation between symbolic and EGMA. And this is, of course, completely the reverse of all of the findings that I've presented to you so far, where we find that uh, you know, symbolic uh, is a much stronger predictor of individual differences in arithmetic and other measures of math compared to non-symbolic. So we were puzzled by that. We also ran a multiple regression in which we found evidence to suggest that non-symbolic now is a unique predictor of math scores, but symbolic is not. Again, the reverse of, for example, what I shared, uh, Zach, uh, Zach Horst's data, which suggested exactly the opposite, where in the multiple regression, symbolic was the only unique predictor. So we were puzzled by this, and we said we have to replicate this. So Sharon said, OK, fine, I'm going into Ivory Coast, neighboring country, very similar context. Let's do another round. So we pre-registered uh, our analyses because we wanted to ensure that we would use exactly the same analyses uh, for the Ivory Coast data compared to the Ghana data. And so uh, in the Ivory Coast, uh, we were able to get data from 355 children. They were between seven and nine years of age. We used both the numeracy screen and the EGMA again, just like in the Ghana data. And what we found is essentially identical in Ivory Coast to what we found in Ghana. 
Again, we found that the relationship between non-symbolic and ECMA was stronger than the relationship between symbolic and ECMA. So this is, again, very puzzling and opposite to the findings in weird populations. And again, a multiple regression revealed that non-symbolic but not symbolic was a unique predictor of math skills. And as I've already said, this isn't just counted to our data, but if we look at meta-analyses, so Michael Scheider's uh, very nice meta-analysis of uh, symbolic and non-symbolic and their association with math, what they reported was that the correlation between symbolic and math was significantly stronger than the correlation between non-symbolic and math. We have data now from two African countries, relatively large samples, suggesting that the reverse is true in those contexts. So I think this really highlights the importance of context, and that context can really change the inferences you make about development and processes of learning. Uh, the data for both the Ivory Coast and Ghana are contrary to data from Western sample. And this probably has a lot to do, and unfortunately we don't have quantitative data alongside with this, and we, I think we need it, is to better understand how number knowledge is acquired across different contexts. On the other hand, I think we need to revisit this question and ask what, what is the world of context? What are, how are children learning about numbers? And how might that influence which systems are being used to scaffold other systems? And indeed, on Monday, I uh, just want to draw your attention to this because it just uh, uh, fits so beautifully uh, with what I've just presented. I just, on Monday, I just came across on social media this new article by uh, the wonderful Stephen uh, Piantadosi at Berkeley University and his group who uh, looked in this uh, paper at 800 individuals who are, come from indigenous uh, uh, communities in the Amazon. And they found a number of things that are really surprising. They found, for example, that in those local economies, the number five plays a very special role. So you pay five for a, a stack of leaves that you use to build your roof, or you pay five for a certain set of plantains. And it turns out that individuals in those communities are really good at multiplying with fives, but they're not very good at counting on for ones. So this is another uh, piece of evidence, I think a much stronger piece of evidence than ours, to suggest the direct influence of the context and the uh, local social-cultural context and how that influences uh, the learning of math and, and subsequent skills. So I'd like to uh, sort of uh, summarize and conclude by addressing the three topics of my talk, the progress, the challenges, and the prongs. So in terms of progress, I think uh, we have significantly furthered our understanding of foundational competence in the domain of math. Uh, we're now at a point where we're severely competing, I think, with the science of reading in terms of identifying key foundational skills. And we've also identified, and by, uh, we, I don't just read my lab, and in many, many groups around the world, have identified symbolic number magnitude processing as a key, and I would add here, in weird populations. And importantly, I think we've refined our understanding of the relationship between cultural and innate skills. And contrary to the dominant narrative, uh, have established that it is not non-symbolic that scaffolds symbolic, but rather the other way around. In terms of challenges, and these are not necessarily negative challenges, but just challenges in general, uh, we need to recognize that translation to the classroom requires real partnerships with educators, rather than educators just being the recipients of the laboratory research. They need to be involved in the development of, of tools, in the refinement of those tools, and that is a process that uh, is not uh, very fundable sometimes, because if it is iterative, it is slow, and it requires a lot of back and forth. And then I think the major challenge uh, in this field, but this field is not alone in psychology, educational, developmental psychology in general, is our focus on weird populations, which leads us to make rather biased inferences. So for example, I have been very challenged by the data from West Africa because it actually runs counter to the narrative uh, that we've been developing on the basis of our weird sample data. So there's lots of work to be done in this space. In terms of promise, I think the translation from basic numerical cognition research to education and back from education to numerical cognition is well in motion. And there's many groups around this work that work with this collaborative approach in mind from the outset of their research protocols and not as an afterthought. I think screening tools are getting better in the domain of numeracy, and this will be further accelerated with edtech and the kind of opportunities that it offers 
And in general, I believe that interactions with other fields, and I hope to have lots of conversations with you throughout this conference, researchers who study mathematics, education, mathematics learning, with a different lens, with a different positionality from mine, that together we will improve our understanding of fundamental developmental processes, fundamental processes of learning, and by doing so will also enhance the application of that knowledge. So with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. I'd like to thank all the people who uh, did this work, my wonderful team at Western University, and as well as my international collaborators, and all of the funders who have generously supported our work over the years. Thank you. A common uh, my comment is that given the credit of your empirical work, I am surprised that you are surprised that you find this difference between Africa and or Amazonian children and Western children. I would not be surprised. The reason is that actually I believe that there is an approximate system for any major domain of the world. An approximate number system, an approximate spatial system, time system, and so on. This system coexists with a central, let's say, relational, symbolic project system that gets Dominance, dominance, dominance as information processing becomes more complex. So in cultures where the sequence system is not very dominant because uh, they don't process extremely complex information as it in the web. It's natural them that the approximate system would dominate because this is what reflects individual differences. In the words, most of the individual differences possible are captured, so to speak, by the central processing system. So the main question to be answered is how we be these occurs. And of course, you don't know where you are with some kids in the words, in the words. Uh, this other system comes deficient and it impedes development. That's my problem. My question Would you be willing to allow me to analyze some of this data? I was indeed surprised. I, I can see part of the answer. I would like to talk with you maybe afterwards how one can develop that into testable hypotheses. Um, with regards to the data, we do share all of our data um, once, we, once we have submitted the, the preprint of the article. With, with, we're very close to that. And then you're more than welcome. I can send you the Open Science Framework link. And uh, you can play with the data to your heart's delight. And I, I would imagine to see what you like. Yeah, I'll, I'll send you anyway. Awesome. Wait. There were a couple of questions still in the beetle, and then there's a question here as well. I mean, that might have been, but it's tricky. Um, my question, of course, is the direction of proportions instead of absolute magnitudes. What you've shown us today was data concerning absolute magnitudes, how the logic representation occurs as the logic representation. Because we know that. Uh, there's also an innate understanding of the uh, proportions, so uh, ratio sets. And I would um, ask him to comment on that how the, what is this day in all its sharpness, uh, in which phase body of the day consists as uh, non body with this age to vice versa. I'm, I'm aware that there are data to suggest that there is a non symbolic racial processing system, that's probably what you've been referring to. Um, as far as I know, there is lots of data suggesting that this racial processing system, the non-symbolic racial processing system, is associated with symbolic fractions or symbolic proportions, but I'm not aware yet of any research that is sort of taking a longitudinal approach and probe these bi-directional relationships. I don't have a specific prediction 
but my my thought would be that probably it would also show up to be unidirectional. But um, this remains to be investigated. There might be real differences here in the developmental dynamics compared to all mammals. Yeah, it'd be really interesting to look at that. And thank you for uh, an excellent, uh, excellent uh, one long with uh, buying the ads. So thank you. Um, I was just thinking about this relationship between uh, between uh, uh, ANS and the simple weak uh, number skills. I think your talk uh, illustrated in an excellent way how uh, the models that we use uh, uh, affect uh, our results. So I think this PMIT uh, ANS is more important example of uh, of how uh, uh, the models we choose, whether we use uh, 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 cross-like panel models, uh, road models, uh, or random intercept models, uh, how that uh, affects uh, uh, our results and actually put it into the models can actually lead to very interesting research and, and we can start a whole line of research that, that isn't very uh, productive. So I mean, uh, that is a very clever blessing to learn from uh, from what you have uh, presented. So I'm also uh, wondering then, uh, can you think of other examples uh, in this area where we might have used models that uh, that aren't uh, robust and perhaps not take into account measure their within the between the variation and so on, uh, where our results are sort of wobbly? Um. Other domains. Um, I'm thinking perhaps the most famous example is, you know, the, there was a paper by Greg Duncan showing that early math skills are an even stronger predictor of later math skills than on later educational achievement than reading skills. That, and you probably know this, that together with Drew Bailey, Greg Duncan reanalyzed those data using random intercept data. And, uh, it turns out that the associations are not as different, and also that the uh, that, that the correlational evidence suggesting early math predicts later school achievement have always been much larger than well, any effects you can get from intervention. So there is sort of this conflict there between you know individual differences approaches and causal manipulations, and I think those the efforts to include things such as random intercept have really brought those two lines of inquiry into line. Another domain I can think of is your domain, reading, where there has been a debate about the relationship between phonological awareness and, 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 and printing and, uh, and phonics, right? And the degree to which those are either unidirectional or bidirectional. So I think we can unpack a lot of things. And I think these kinds of developmental models help to address some of the biases that are often held in the field. So I think in my field, um, there is a strong nativist bias. So people cannot imagine a world where children develop skills through cultural transmission, uh, through learning from others, but instead it must always be some, some specialized module in the brain that does everything from the beginning. So I think these kinds of, uh, the study of development can help to address these questions and then also hopefully lead to accommodation of theory as well. I'm only four. Hello? Hi, my name is Christine Knut from the Erasmus English Society of Rotterdam. Um, I have a quick question about the example you gave us, where you showed us the different dots, and you mentioned that one, two, three, four, that's very easy for us to discern, and since it goes above six, then it becomes a lot harder. My first response to that was, yeah, that makes sense, because that's how many dots are on, for example, a dice or a dublin. So maybe we as an audience are very used to seeing dot representations in those ways. Do you think that was any kind of influence, or do you think it was really transcend that? Your question is sort of about whether arrays are arranged canonically, such as dice patterns, or whether they are arranged randomly. Uh, and this is a question that dates back to like the 1980s. There's a famous paper by Mandel and Shibo, I think it's 1982, that looked at this. It turns out that, yes, canonical patterns do scout, because you know, as soon as you've got familiarity with the dice, the dice face essentially becomes a symbolic representation. Um, however, when it comes to subitizing, whether you measure it with canonical or non-canonical arrays, it's identical. And the reason for that seems to be that uh, subitizing is really the consequence of, of a sort of bottleneck in our visual system. So we are able to process in parallel and track the motion trajectory of objects 
of about of set size of about three to four. And that allows us then to rapidly map those number symbols onto those quantities, but it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily work differentially for canonical or random arrays. But canonical arrays can play a really important role and can be a really important shortcut as well. Children could learn those configurations and very quickly map them onto the symbolic counterparts. Uh, thank you for a fantastic talk, Alex. Um, yeah, it's really interesting to see your findings from African countries where there is an what's what in general in um, the Earth population. I was wondering what you think about other weird populations, I'm um, sorry, other non weird populations like Aiden and developing populations. Where do you think that there might be some similar differences in? where it's non synodic or symbolic agilities that are just not reading. You'll be expert in that, but I, I think that is entirely possible here, right? That we've got these, um, as our former mentor, Ned Cowan of Smith used to say, but atypical developmental trajectories, different start points, different endpoints. So I do think these dynamics could play out differently in, in atypical populations for sure. Really nice to investigate that more deeply. Yeah. The symbolic representations were depicted as Arabic numbers. Where might be the place for number words? Here there can be a little for email orders. Spoken number words are obviously the first foray into symbolic number processing. Because children learn the count sequence, the meaning of counting, typically before they learn the meaning of Hindu Arabic numerals, and presumably they map a lot of their verbal number knowledge onto the symbolic number knowledge. Number words is an interesting one. Um, I don't know a lot about this, but um, uh, there's a researcher, unfortunately, and he's no longer with us, but uh, his work, um, Jimmy Campbell at the University of Saskatchewan, who spent most of his career trying to understand these format differences and the degree to which number words and digits are processed differently. And some neuropsychological models predict different pathways for Arabic digit processing and number word processing. When we look at the level of the brain, we see them practically indistinguishable, since they seem to point to the same underlying semantic representations. Developmentally, I don't know a lot about written number word acquisition. Uh, of course, that will also severely interact with reading and decoding and so forth, so there'll be lots of, lots of things going on there. Bye. Thank you for that. Uh Great talk with the clear message. Uh, a bit of a uh, left field question. Uh, so you show that uh, symbolic, uh, the symbolic system predicts, at least in real population, for mass brains, right? Uh, for what other things does it predict? In? And I'm thinking especially of something like computational thinking skills, like coding and programming. Interesting question. I do not know the answer to that question, but I'm sure there's been work on that. I wonder whether my colleague Bert Smith uh, you know something about that, but I, I am not I'm not uh, I'm not aware of any work on that. It would be interested to investigate that. What's your prediction? I think it might, but on the other hand, coding is also seen very linguistic yes. uh, symbolic, right? So it would be interesting to balance to see which of the two. Yes, yeah, for sure. I just kept on wondering, because you showed us these pictures of the brain and the options, and that they were very different for symbolic and non-symbolic. And then your relationship between the picture between is symbolic predicts us non-symbolic outcomes or not. And I just kept wondering, is it not just a coincidence that you found these results in your world yeah, with analysis? And I wonder, have you tested direct relationships between symbolic and non-symbolic uh, with uh, ratios? I, for example, show me a five and then give two options of four dots and five dots and then ask students like, which one's right and the other way around. Well, you see a symbol and then two possible dot arrays? Is that what you're asking? Yes, for example, or in some kind of way that, that you ask the relationship between yeah, this yeah. is an aid. Oh yeah, no, no, there, there's, there's tons of work on that, but the question is, do you, do you ask them to do it approximately or exactly, right? So children can, can very well map digits to dots, um, but that doesn't mean that the representations of digits were scaffolded by the non symbolic number system. It just means that they can translate between those systems. 
Yeah, and we have, that, we have the mixed comparison task as well, right? Which is a little bit like what you were saying. It does have two options, but you have to sort of decide which one's larger. It turns out that both adults and children find that task pretty difficult. And that to us, again, suggests that these representations are maybe not as closely tied um, as one might think. And, and maybe one follow-up question on that. Yeah. Uh, because I'm from the Netherlands, and in the Netherlands, uh, teachers work the most in the issues in excellent wealth books is that they first learn with county adults, and then they leave this representation of a number, and then they could try to enter the uh, you see that uh, for quite a long time, uh, teachers trying to, you uh, know, to give them this model of gods or or other kinds of figures before they, until they really get the numbers, and then they just leave the dots. But sometimes the students not really well in order to gathering the numbers, they stick to these dots quite well. And if you say that numbers are actually more predicting math. Uh, it, yeah, outcomes later on. Um, is it that advisable for teachers to keep on sticking to these models of presentations of numbers for a certain amount of time, or would you advise otherwise? Um, so I think we have to really importantly distinguish here between representation systems and stimuli that you use in instruction. You need concrete and pictorial stimuli in order to teach math early on. I don't want you to walk away thinking that my talk suggests we shouldn't be doing concrete representation on abstract. Of course we should. What, I'm, what, what my talk says is not against using dots. It's saying the kinds of representations that we share with other species that can be measured through dot discrimination, they could also be measured through, through discriminating number of tones. The exact stimuli doesn't matter. The stimuli is just a way of getting into that system. That that system is not a scaffold for symbolic number. That does not mean that when you teach symbolic number, you shouldn't be using dots. You probably shouldn't be using dot estimation to pair, you know, children typically use counting to determine the cardinality of a set, and then you can connect that to arriving digits. You should definitely continue with that. And especially for students who are struggling with math, often leaving them longer with concrete or pictorial representations is critical. So I would never advocate against that. What I would say is that the kinds of systems that support discrimination and estimation that we share with other species, those are not relevant when it comes to the acquisition of symbolic number. Exact counting of sets is, of course, really important. That's how children first learn number words. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. We we'll have time for two three questions, and there is one hand there. This, this point, your, your last point, uh, one of the last points about translation and location with most the um, so I was wondering if you have any insights, examples of the point in the model work on practical implications beyond the screen. And it's great to see the screen and mark me out and look up. But I wonder if anything is coming out. Not Thanks, Bobby, for the insights around the international view of uh, those conditions. We did in, in, in practical either uh, interventions or exit planning, you know, with the way. And I think, I think the, the research around directionality doesn't really lend itself to direct implications. But I think what it does suggest is that, for example, you know, that for a number of years, people tested this idea that maybe if you train the approximate number system, that will lead to spillover effects on symbolic math. Well, that research, you know, there's meta-analysis out there, I didn't have time to talk about it, suggests that it does not work, right? So that's, we've eliminated that as a potential approach. But I think more broadly speaking, the sort of numerical cognition work lends itself for translation. I mean, one example I think is the use of number lines, you know, research on number lines has really led to more proliferation of the use of number lines and instruction as an instructional tool, not just for teaching whole numbers, but teaching fractions as well. So that's one example. Um, and I would say more broadly speaking, um, uh, teachers becoming more aware of what are some of the foundational skills will impact the way in which they, in which they carry out their instruction. So. To the beyond folk and science, 
And I pass him his little pie, and then we should expect that the rain and see what it makes system. And can scap all the symbolic wash that he could be drawn the symbolic system for the world as five years. And when we try to teach math to people by verbal instructions, symbol instructions. Um, what I'm saying is that schools have no authors. Um, they lack between the innate and the symbolic, the most symbolic and the symbolic systems is due to base, to our Western culture and um, cultures. So um, what we think that if we put feed more uh, the non symbolic system by analogic strategies, by uh, proposing exercises uh, since kindergarten of this system, could we expect a, a stronger leap within the agency? Because we already have that data. Um, there have been people trying to do exactly what you're saying, it's like straighten the ANS. Um, and the initial results look pretty good when you look at the studies in isolation. Um, but when you take a meta-analytic approach, it's actually pretty... Um, keep on having feedback. I won't start here yeah, again. Yeah. Um, the results are pretty depressing because what uh, meta-analysis out of Trubedi's lab found was that not only is there no evidence that ANS training improves symbolic math, but ANS training also doesn't really improve ANS performance on other non-symbolic tasks. So this leads to a whole other debate as to whether there is actually a there there with the approximate number system. I didn't really want to go there today, but I am going to go there now. Uh, these kinds of things, that, so there is there's still a debate to be had as to whether we should actually take, it, take this idea of an approximate number system deep and seriously, because there are measurement issues, training it doesn't lead to even near transfer, these are alarming signs that, and this could all be down to measurement, it may not be down to the underlying system, of course we have to distinguish between the measurement and the representations themselves. But I don't, from my point of view, I don't see any worth in investing into any kind of ANS training related activities in classrooms. Just to go for one point of your talk, so I thought what you said, but what might explain is your actual identity, not symbol, not symbol, not symbol uh, is actually this perfect. So, so you didn't name it, but actually we were talking about basically four exactly functions. So I was thinking my question is about like, whether there might be moderators or the years of the relationship between the two, even if they going back to the um, time. I also, actually, my question is about whether you could explain the difference between weird and non weird this fact, and why you would say that not meant. The layered and what we put it But that would be important to look at. There are papers to suggest, of course, that EF plays a large role that may have a moderating effect on this relationship as well. It could have something to do with the weird, non weird countries. Again, we, I don't think we had EF there. We had uh, language measures that we controlled for. Uh, but this would be really interesting uh, to, to investigate further for sure. Um, there have to be mediating, moderating effects on this relationship. And that might help to explain the weird, non weird differences. So, yeah. Something to look, look into in the future, for sure. Hence. So that was an excellent discussion. Please join me in a round of applause for our keynote speaker.